Good evening, everyone. Today we're going to learn our first sorting algorithm, that is bubble sorts. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a mini series. This first video is going to focus on bubble sorts and teach you all the prerequisite knowledge and everything you need to know it about uh, being able to master the bubble sort algorithm. Um, afterwards, after kind of mastering the bubble sort algorithm, you're going to be able to transition over to insertion sort, which is part two. So definitely watch this one first. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and focus on this uh, bubble sort. So you might be asking, what are some characteristics? What What is it, right? It sounds kind of strange always to hear algorithm and, and hear it in such a formalized way. So let's go ahead and <clears throat> try to break it down piece by piece. So at on the surface level, it is a sorting algorithm. What that means is, let's say you want any kind of list of numbers sorted. So let's say I have the values 10, 50. So actually, let's go ahead and just put some values just to put that into perspective. So it's, let's say, for example, I have 50, 30, 20, 10, and I want these sorted into ascending order such that it will look like this, 10, 20, 30, 50. I can do this right uh, logically on my own because it's small enough, but programmatically, how do you do it? A bubble sort will get us to that answer. So it really all it does is it takes some, some group of values and it'll put them into a specific order. So in this case, we're using, as an example, a list of numbers. It doesn't have to actually just be numbers, um, and it doesn't even have to be in ascending order. I could have done it in descending order. So it would have been 50, 30, 20, 10, or I could have used, like, let's say, words. So you, you can alphabetically sort things as well. So think of ever if you've ever visited a library, things are sorted in an alphabetical order. Um, the only key to be able being able to use bubble sort is that the values that you have, they have to be comparable. What that means is if you have two values, you have to have a way to define if one is greater than another one or one is less than another value. If you have that, then you're able to perform bubble sort on it. So it doesn't matter what the data type is. You might already know in programming, you can create your own data types. So let's say I create a fish, fish objects. I can use bubble sort on fish objects as long as I know how to compare them. How is one fish greater than another fish? Is it based off of weight? Right? Maybe one weighs another more than another one. Is it based off of uh, inches, uh, like size and in inches? Um, how do you do that comparison? Once you define that comparison, we're able to sort it. <clears throat> so that being said, we understand it's a sorting algorithm. Okay, so so far so good. Uh, the next part is what are some sources of confusion with this algorithm? The biggest source of confusion, I would say, this is more subjective on my part, but what I believe, it's the fact that there's going to be some nested for loops. Okay, so in order to properly implement it, you have to have two for loops, one outer for loop, one inner for loop. And this um, can be a little bit tricky for um, starting programmers just because of the logic between the two. Um, but the way we're going to approach it today, all we really care about is the inner for loop, the actual for loop that performs the work. The outer for loop, we don't even care about it. Just forget about it for now. We're not even going to focus on it. We only care about the inner for loop, which is going to allow us to pass through um, our list of, of items or objects or values we, we choose to focus on. That's all we care about. So if you can focus on one for loop, it's going to make this problem so much easier. So now for the third part, and this is the most important part that I want you to understand, is the, the main loop logic, the inner loop that we're going to be focusing on. What is the the essence of bubble sort essentially? And it's this this inner loop. So there's three parts to it. Number one, whenever you go through that inner loop, what you're really doing is you're going through your list from the beginning to one before the end. Okay. So I want you to I want you to kind of say it with me. I know this is a recording, but I want you to say this with me. You're going to start from the beginning, and you're going to go one two before the end. So beginning and then one before the end. And it's very important that you do this. Don't go from the beginning all the way to the end. And this, and we're going to clarify why that is in just a moment. So in the part B, which is also important, <clears throat> as you're going through your list, so you start off with the first value, then you go to the next value, and so forth and so forth, and you stop here on one before the end. What you're really doing is you're taking the current value. So initially, I start at the beginning, index 0, right? So this value 14, and I compare it to my neighbor. So I compare it to 46. Makes sense, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna be comparing the current value to your neighbor. 
And notice I use a little C to refer to current, and I use N to refer to my neighbor or my next value. Either one's kind of a great way to think about it, neighbor, next. Uh, we don't want to use indexes, at least for now, because it can be confusing. All we care about is the current value that you're on and your neighbor. So you do that comparison. Then when I go to the next iteration or the next loop, this is now my current value. And this is my neighbor. Makes sense. And then the next time, this is my current, and then that's my neighbor. Current, that's my neighbor. Current, that's my neighbor. Current, that's my neighbor. Current, that's my neighbor. Notice this. This is the interesting part. This is the last case where I actually have a valid neighbor. So this is my current value. Notice I'm one before the end, and my neighbor is at the end. Okay. So if I if I have my current go all the way to the end, who's my neighbor? There is no neighbor. And this is where I essentially um, run into issues because I'm out of out of bounds. So it's very important that you follow the principle that the inner loop, the loop that's important, is going to go from the beginning to one before the end. The reason being is that we're always going to reference that element and its neighbor, OK, the current to its neighbor. So now that we have those two principles, which I hope makes sense, let's go to the last part. <clears throat> and the last part is, and this is going to be the simplest part of bubble sort, uh, but also the, perhaps one of the most important parts is if they're out of order, right? So let's say the two that we're comparing, the current and the neighbor, if they're out of order, go ahead and swap places. And if they're not, don't do anything. That's it. That's really it. So for example, in this case, let's 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 go through this. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to repeat these principles at the end of the video. Uh, but let's see if these make sense by doing a single iteration of bubble sort. So we're going to perform a single iteration of bubble sort. And this is the most important part. If you master this, you master bubble sort. So how do we do this? First off, we need to start at the beginning. So I need to start my current at the beginning of the list. So that's the first element, also known as index zero. OK, so this is your first element. This is index zero. This is index one, index two, index three, and so forth. That's how arrays work. So this is my current value. Next up, my next neighbor, or my neighbor, Right is going to be right here. So my next value is one index above. So we don't we don't really want to focus on indexes, but we just want to say it's the guy in, out to your right. That's really it. And what we want to do is we want to compare them. So for now, we're going to assume for this example that we want an ascending order. OK, just for now, we're going to assume the sort is an ascending order. So we want the smaller values on the left, the bigger values on the right. All right, so you can imagine if you're counting values one, two, three, four, five, that's in ascending order, right? So if we compare these two values, would you say that they're in order or out of order? So if I compare 14 on the left, 46 on the right, they're in order, right? That, that makes sense. OK, so in that case, we're going to keep them the same. We don't want to do a single thing. And then we're done. That's, that's pretty much it. Then we're going to go to the next iteration, right? We're going to go move to the right. So we're done with 14. Let's do 46 as our current, and then our neighbor moved over as well. Our neighbor's 43, or our next is 43. So that being said, let's go ahead and compare them. So 46 is on my left. It's the current, and then 43 is the neighbor. Are they in order or out of order? Well, we could see here they're out of order, right? So the bigger value should be on the right. It shouldn't be on the left-hand side. So in this case, we're going to do a swap. <clears throat> For now, we're not going to focus on the actual um, uh, logistics of the swap, uh, we're just going to go ahead and swap them. So this is going to be the 43 now, and this is going to be the 46 now, okay, like that. So now they're in order, okay? So these have been kind of placed in order. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move forward. So we swapped it. We're done with our work. Let's go to the next value. Are these, I'm going to go a little faster here, are these in order or are they out of order? They're out of order. So what did we say we do if they're out of order? To swap them. So here we have 27, here we have 46, just like that. <clears throat> OK, very good. We're done with this value. So now we're going over one, one forward again in our loop. So now we're at 46 and 70. Are they in order or out of order? They're in order, correct. So then we're going to go ahead and keep moving. 70 and 57, are they in order or out of order? They're in order. I mean, sorry, out of order. What am I saying? They're out of order, right? So 70 is bigger than 57. So we want to go ahead and swap them. And we do 57. And we have 70, like that. Next up, we're going to go ahead and move forward. Is 70 and 41. Compare these two. Are they in order or out of order? Out of order. So swap them. 
41. This is 70. You guys already see probably where I'm going with this, but uh, we're going to continue going on until we finish this loop. So here we have 70 and 45. Are they in order or out of order? They're out of order. This should be 45. This should be 70. Like that. And then the last case is I move forward here. Why do I say the last case? Because I do it one before the end. I don't want my current to reach the end. I want to do it one before the end. So now I'm going to compare these two. Are they in order or out of order? They are um, out of order. So let's go ahead and swap them. So this is 21 and this is 70. And that's really it. That's a single iteration of bubble sort. That's it. That's the only thing that I need you to focus on. You need to go from the beginning to one before the end, or do that comparison from the current value to its neighbor. And if they're out of order, swap them. If they're not, don't do a single thing. That's it. This is a single iteration. So you might be saying, wait, wait, wait. This doesn't look <laughs> like they're sorted, right? This, this looks like they're still a little bit out of order because this 27 is here, and it should be between maybe the 14 and the 43, right? What, what's going on? And the reason why it's still out of order is because, as you as you might see, I wrote this as a single iteration of bubble sort. What does that mean? This means that this is one passover, one loop of bubble sort logic. Now, in order for this to work effectively, you actually have to do many, many of these loops. You just have to repeat the same logic. But if you uh, watch any of my previous videos on on looping, the most important part is the inner logic, the inner loop logic. If once you have that down, right? So that's that's the meat and potatoes. That's the difficult part. The outer loop, the wrapping of a, of an outer loop that says do this ten times, twenty times, thirty times. That's very simple. It's just you know a quick like two lines of code. That's that's all it is, or one line of code, single for loop. The the most important part is this. This is the processing. Uh, this is the code that's actually doing the the swapping. It's going ahead and going through it um, in a correct sequence. Um, we just have to repeat this same logic as many number of times as you have elements. So I know that sounds a little bit confusing. So uh, let's let's look back at this specific problem. So for this one, I have how many elements? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have nine elements. All right. So would you would agree? I have nine total elements. Now, in order for this to work, I have to perform bubble. I have to perform these this iteration that we just did. I've only done it once so far. In order for it to be guaranteed to be sorted, I need to do this eight times. So how did I calculate that? Well, you get the total number of elements that you have or the length of your list, and you subtract it by one, and that's how many times you need to perform it to guarantee that it'll be sorted. So if we repeated this um, seven more times, right, because we've done it once, we need an eight, eight total times, then I can guarantee to you that this would be in a sorted, uh, this would be uh, sorted in ascending order. Now, that being said, we're not going to go through it <laughs> eight times, right? Because that would take kind of a while. Um, but um, in order to do that, we just stick uh, an outer for loop to make that happen. So once again, the, the main logic here is just to go ahead and uh, perform these three steps, right? Perform this logic, and then we'll stick an outer loop to just repeat it. Now, you might be saying, why, why is this the case? Well, what, what's bubble sort really doing? And bubble sort, what it's really doing is it's grabbing the largest value. This was our starting list, okay? This was our starting list. It essentially swaps values, but what it really focuses on is it grabs the largest value and it puts it to the, the farthest right location. So notice the 70, it started off here in the middle and it ended up being right here at the very end. And that's because as we swapped, right? When, whenever we swap that things were out of order, the greatest value always wants to be on the right-hand side if you're doing it in ascending order. And so those, those swappings, those swappings, those swappings will eventually lead to the greatest value being in the last place. And then on the next iteration, it'll have the second greatest value being the second to last. Then it'll have the third greatest value being the third to last. And you can see where I'm going with this. Now you might be saying, well, in that case, shouldn't it be nine times? So if there's nine elements, shouldn't you have to do it nine times? You could do it nine times. That'll just be an extra time that um, you didn't have to do it, but you, you definitely could do it nine times. Um, but the reason being is that let's let's consider an example. If I have if I have this list of values, let's say like three, four, one, right? Um, actually, yeah. Let's say I have let's just say I have three values. And two are sorted. Two are sorted. 
let's say I have three values and two are sorted. If two are in the correct position, that means I know that the third value is in the correct position because there's only one place for it to be. Think of it that way. So let's say you have three slots in a machine and you have two of them already in the correct position. Where can the third value, where can the third kind of thing go into the machine in its correct position? So uh, the same thing uh, holds true if I have 100 values and 99 of them are in, are in the correct position. Well, that last one must also be in the correct position if the other 99 are already sorted. So that goes back to this principle. If I have 100, I just need to perform it 90, 99 times. That's the worst case. Um, there's ways to kind of make it a little bit more optimized so you don't have to do it that many times because then that's kind of inefficient. But enough about that. Now that we kind of understand what we're doing, we're focusing on that single iteration algorithm for now. Now, in order to do this, what we're going to focus on is some prerequisite knowledge. What do I mean by that? Um, you have to know how number one for loops work. You have to be comfortable with swapping two values. And you also have to have some experience with indexing with arrays. So just know how arrays work in general. I know I've already mentioned indexes, but you really need to be comfortable with these three concepts in order to feel a mastery of bubble sort. So let's go ahead and start with our first example. So our first example, let's go ahead and comment this for now. And we're going to start right here within main. And we're going to use a for loop. Specifically, we're going to show the syntax for printing out numbers. Let's say I want to print out uh, 0, 0 through 9. Okay, So this might be an example that you could see just you know something to quickly run through. So here, we're going to say 4. We're going to give a local variable name like my number um, in. And we're going to use the range function. OK, we're going to use the range function so that it gives us kind of values to iterate through. So in this case, I'm going to put 10 because I want to go 0 through 9. And then just to prove to you that this is going to print out correctly, let's go ahead and run it. Just like that, you can see that I have the values 0 through 9. Now, how does this work? Because this seems a little bit, right? if you're not familiar with for loops, this seems a little bit tricky. Um, the way that it works is my number is the actual counter, right? the loop counter if you're coming from another language. or and the way that this works is when you use the range function, you provide some value like 10. And there's really three inputs that are being passed into here. The three inputs that are being passed are number one, which is the starting point, which is always 0. The starting point is 0, which is why we start counting as 0. The third value that we're passing in is 1, which means count by 1s. So that's, that's where we usually see like count plus plus or counter plus plus, right? If you're coming from another language, or you might see counter plus equals one, right? the compound assignment operator. So that's how much we're incrementing by. So notice we start at zero, we're counting by ones. And then this middle value right here is one before the end. OK, so it's essentially saying less than this value. So that's why we're stopping at nine, because this is less than 10. OK, less than 10 means nine in this case. Um, and, and so really, if I wanted to print these values again, I would just print it out in the same format, right? Both of those two are equivalent. I could choose to write just the 10, or I could choose to write the three values. That's that's pretty much it. And just for uh, clarity, this is the start. This is one more than the stop. So this is not going to be included, right? So it's always one more than the stop. So that's why if we say 10, it's going to be, it will actually stop at 9. And then this is how much you want to, let's say, alter the counter by. I don't say increment because you can also decrease by a value. I could put minus one and, to, and, and you know start decreasing. So a good example would, could be like, let's say I want to start at 10. I want to stop at before zero, and I want to go ahead and subtract one. So I'm going to start at 10, then go 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, but I don't get to zero. So notice if I print this out, it's going to go 10 all the way to 1. So that's how you use the for loop. Now, the other thing to consider is what if you have a list, right? What if you have an array like this? And I want to be able to iterate through it. <clears throat> the way you can do that is, once again, you'll go through and you'll say for, you know, x or like four elements in range. So this, this way, we're going to be able to get, um, actually, let's go through elements and let's go through range. Um, so if I just say four elements in endlist, 
this is going to allow me to get the actual elements. So if I print out the elements like this, notice I'm able to get the elements directly because I'm saying for each of the elements or for each of the values or elements inside of this list. But this is a little bit of a problem because when we do a for each loop like this, um, we're only allowed to kind of iterate through it in a forward manner and we don't have any indexes. So what if I wanted to go backwards? Or what if I wanted to search for something and say where I found it? What index did I find it at? Oh, I found it at index two, right? So let's instead use indexes. Okay, let's use, let's use counters. The way we can do that is we could say for index, I'm just calling it index right now. It's, it doesn't actually, um, it's just to be descriptive. It doesn't have to be called index, but we're gonna say for index in range. And uh, let's go ahead and give it the length of our list. So once again, this is nine values. We need to give it nine, but obviously we don't want to hard code it. Instead, we want to use the length function to give it nine, which is the length of our list like this. And just like that, if we print out the index, just know it's going to go from zero to eight, just because we have nine elements and that's going to be the index for them. So how do we get from indexes to elements? And that's going to be part three, All right? So I think that's the, that's part three, indexing with arrays. Ah, let's just skip to part three. That's That should be fine. And then I'll show you how to swap values. So if I want to, if I want to um, uh, go through these values, these specific elements, I need to be able to index them. So this is the name of my list. I'm calling it end list, right? Uh, um, this is just an example. And this is the first element that I have. In order for me to grab the first element, I would use the name of the array and then I would give it the index zero. So index zero just means that it's the first element. So they're always kind of offset by one because programmers, we start counting as zero, okay? So that means that in this instance, this is index zero, first element. This is index one, your second element. This is index two, your third element. This is index three, your fourth element, and so forth and so forth. Now, how do you get to the last element, right? So we already know this is how you get to your first element. How do you get to the last one? Your last one is always going to be the length of your array. So in this case, the length of my array minus one. And how do I prove that to you? The way I prove that to you is because we, we know the first one is at index zero. The last one is at index eight. Well, what's the length? What's the length of this array? It's nine. And what is nine minus one? That's eight. And what did we say the last element was? Eight, right? So that's how you use a little bit of uh, programming logic to get either from the first or to the last one, like that. So uh, that's a little bit of what we need for arrays. And that's what we need for the for loop. Next up is going to be swapping two values, working with uh, values, being able to swap them. So for that, let's go ahead and take a look at this example. So in order to swap two values, let's say, for example, I have the first value, which is five, and the second value, which is six. Now, if I print out the first value and I print out the second value, we can obviously see that this should be printing out five and six. But what if I want to reverse them, right? What if I want six to be in the first value and five to be in the second value? How do we, how do we go about doing that? Well, in reality, in order to do this, we need a third we need a third variable in order to do this. And why do we need a third variable? Because let's let's just see how we could do this incorrectly and then we'll do it correctly. So if we were to do this incorrectly, you might think of something like this. You could say that the first value would be given the second value and the second value would be given the first. You might think of something like this. But let's let's follow that logic. So you're going to grab the second value which is 6. You're going to take a copy of that, and you're going to overwrite the first value with that six, like that. Next up, you're going to say, grab the value in first, which is six, and stick it in second. So I'm going to grab that six and replace it with the six. Uh-oh. Looks like we got rid of the five, right? We accidentally lost it. And so this is not the right approach. In order for this to work correctly, you have to understand that we need a third temporary variable. Okay, we need a third temporary variable in order to stick one of these values, okay? Um, so uh, we want it to be temporary and we wanna give it 
the value of the second. Now, it doesn't really matter for that third variable which value it gets. It can either get the first value, which is the five, the second value, which is the six, as it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. However, I strongly recommend kind of picking one and sticking with it so that you develop that habit and it becomes kind of easy to remember. For me, I like to use the second value. It just makes more sense for me. So I'm gonna be going through that in this example. For me, I'm gonna go ahead and store the second value here. So it's gonna have a copy of that six in this example, like that. Now that I have a copy of the six, I can go ahead and grab the five and put it in here. I can overwrite the second variable. So I can say second equals first. And what that really means is that second now has five, right? So we can think of it this way. So second now has five. Then the last thing that I need to do is I need the six to go into the first variable. So first I need to give it the six, but who has the six? It's the temporary variable. The temporary variable is the one with the six. So that's why I'm going to assign it the temp value. And now, first now has the six, just like that. And if I print this out, right? So sorry. if I print this out, I give it its original orders and I print this out. Notice it's going to print out six five. And we've successfully swapped it. So once again, as a quick review, whenever you swap, you need a temporary variable. In my case, I always give it the second value. I'll go ahead and then overwrite the second value with the first. And then I can overwrite the first with the temp value, right? So that's really how you do the swap. Uh, these are some important things to consider. Make sure you feel comfortable with the prerequisite knowledge and the sorting algorithm that we just went through prior to continuing on the video. This next part of the video, we're actually gonna go over the single iteration of the bubble sort, which is the important part to consider. So strongly, strongly make sure if you don't understand um, of what we've gone through um, in very good detail, make sure to rewatch it because it's going to be very important you feel comfortable with all of this prior to actually coding it out. So now that that's said, um, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started. All right. So um, in order to get started, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and erase this so that we're not worried about it. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, comment this out. So now we're just focused on how do we do that single iteration of bubble sort that we described earlier? How do we do it, right? Well, in order to do it, we have to be able to go through our, our list, right? So here we have a, a function defined as single iteration of bubble sort. What do we feed it? We feed it some list. So this is our list to sort. Okay, sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself without describing the parameters. But this is the list that we want to sort. This is that list of, let's assume it's this list of values right here. Right. What we want to do is we want to go from beginning to end. And so we're going to use an index to go from beginning to end. So starting at zero all the way to one, one before, so the last index. Um, so in this instance, we're going to say for current index in range. And once again, we need to give it the length of our list to sort. But remember, what, what did we want to do? Do we want to go all the way to the end? Because this will go from zero all the way to the last index. No. We want to go to one before the end. So we want to iterate through our list from beginning to one before the end. So if I had just put, if I had just written it like this, this would be from the beginning to the end. This is now one before the end, just like that. So hopefully that's making sense so far. Next up. What we want to do is we want to keep track of, we have our current index. OK, that's our current index. What we want next is our next index or our neighbor index. Feel free to use either uh, notation. I just like using next, so current next. Uh, it kind of makes more sense to me. But uh, in order to calculate it, it's going to be the current index plus 1. And the reason why that is is because, say, for example, in this case, what are the indexes? In this case, current is 0 and next is 1, right? Let's say, for example, if I moved over, what's my current? Current index is 1. My next is 2. So the way you calculate your next index, it's always going to be your current plus 1. And that's why I chose to write it like this. So whenever you update your current index, your next index also gets updated to be 1 more than the current. OK? All right, next up is we're going to say if. All right, we're going to go ahead and say if. Mm, actually, before we do this, I just want to write out the comment. So if they are out of order, 
swap them. Okay, that's what we're doing. So if they're out of order in the body, we want to swap them. So how do we know they're out of order? The way we know that they're out of order is, so you can kind of already intuitively tell, but we just want to check them out. So it's if the current value is greater than the next value. If your current value is bigger than the next value, that means they're out of order. And the reason why we set it up like this is because we want to do it in ascending order. Now, if it was in descending order, we'd swap it. But for now, since we're focusing on ascending order, we're going to say if the current value is greater than the next guy, then swap them. So I hope that that made sense. So if they're out of order means if the, so we have to say list of sorts at the current index. Notice I'm saying the current index. So this refers to the current elements. If the current elements, is greater than the next elements, that means they're out of order. And so what should we do? In this case, we should swap them. Sorry, I'm so used to C++ and other programming languages with brackets that kind of forget to stop using them. So in this case, if they're out of order, how do we swap them? Well, we already said we need a temporary variable. And we're going to go ahead and assign it the second value. So what is the second value in my mind? It's not the current, it's the neighbor, it's the next. So I'm going to go ahead and assign them this second value. Now that I've already made a copy of this second value, I can go ahead and get that second value and stick in the first value. So what's the first value? It's current index right here, or the current element. So now but I've already made the swap. I've already made the change to the second index, right, or the second value. So now I'm going to go ahead and change this first value just like before, it's just like the temporary, um, the, just like the swap values we did earlier. We're going to grab the first value and stick temp in there. Okay. So what did we do? In temp, we stuck the second value. Then we over, then we overwrite it the the second value with the first. Then we overwrite the first value with temp, just like that. And this is exactly how we went through it in, in our practice problems. That's why I want to make sure you feel comfortable with it. And that's that's really it. That's how you perform a single iteration of bubble sort. And to prove that to you. Right, this is what our iteration looked like when we were done. This is what our values looked like when we were done with our first iteration of bubble sort. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and apply our single iteration of bubble sort. We're gonna apply our single iteration of bubble sort to this list and see what it prints out. So notice, uh, here's my list, right? I'm gonna go ahead and call single iteration of bubble sort on this list and I'm gonna print it out and let's see what we get. Just like that, we get 14, 14, 43, 43, 27, 46, 57, 41, 45, 21, 70. Exactly like that. And if we had repeated this nine times, right? Because this has a length as if this, um, sorry, if we had repeated this eight times, I apologize, eight times, this would be fully sorted. And I can prove that to you. The way we can do that is I can write bubble sort. Uh, so that, that's what we have here in bubble sort. Let's go ahead and uncomment this. Let's get rid of this for now. And let's go ahead and just do a for loop for um, uh, what's called, uh, let's say number of iterations, iterations in range nine. We said it was nine for this specific case. I'm gonna call the single iteration of bubble sorts on the list of sort. So notice I'm I'm hard coding it so it's it's performing nine times. Or was it eight times? Eight times. We wanted to run it. And we want to run it eight times on this list. Okay. So on this list, we're instead of calling single iteration, we're going to go ahead and repeat it, repeatedly call it. Actually, let's not call it in here. Sorry. Apologize. Let's call it in the main loop. So this is a single iteration and we're just going to repeatedly call it nine times. So four iterations in range nine. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to call this. Why do I keep saying nine? It's, it should be eight because it's, it's it has nine elements. So we're going to do it eight times. And then let's print it. And we can see now it's in sorted order. Okay? So exactly like we said, if you do one iteration of it, it gets the biggest value, puts it on the right. If you do a second iteration, it gets the next, next biggest value and puts it on the right. And it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Um, now, in this case, we were able to prove that if you do it enough times, it'll actually get sorted. And that's what we're seeing here. So if we do want to do bubble sort, we want to focus on this for loop. This is the single for loop we care about. 
And in order to define it properly, just bubble sort itself, all we have to do is let's let's just put it here. Let's just um, uncomment this. Okay. And we're going to say for the number of bubble sort iterations, or I don't know, single number of single bubble sort iterations that we want to perform is how many times? We want however long our list is minus one. Remember, you don't have to do it. If your list is 100 values, um, you don't have to do it 100 times. You have to do it 99 times. Or you don't necessarily have to do it 99 times. But um, in order to guarantee it, you would do it 99 times. And then you go ahead and write your single iteration of bubble sort so that it's sorted. So this is the meat and potatoes right here that you want to focus on. And once you do that, just go ahead and stick it in and uh, uh, wrap it in another for loop that says, hey, keep repeating this as, as many times as you need to. And that's it. So if we, instead of doing it this way, what I can do is now I could just use that bubble sort algorithm that we that we set up, and it should print the same. I hope that that made sense. Uh, definitely uh, let me know if you have any questions, but that's, that's really all that there is to bubble sort. It's just one for loop that we're focused on. Um, as promised, we're going to go through this one more time. Just I know you're probably sick of hearing this, but it's very important that you are familiar with the logic. So what did we do? for the single iteration of bubble sort, which is the most important part of it. It's you go through from the beginning to one before the end, right? Because you don't you can't go to the end or else you don't have a neighbor to swap with, right? You kind of go out of bounds in that case. So you go from the beginning all the way to one before the end. You compare the current value to its to the next value or the neighbor. And if they're out of order, go ahead and swap them. If they're not, notice what did we do if they're not out of order? We didn't do anything, right? So there's there's no else in this case. If it's else, it's just, you right? So you either swap them or you do nothing. You pretty much reach the conclusion of that iteration. And this is our single iteration. And then what we do is we continuously run a single iteration um, as many times as you need to to get it sorted, which is essentially the length of it minus one. That's, that's all there is to bubble sorts. Um, there is one optimization and that's that, because you might be saying, hey, you know, this doesn't really seem scalable. What if I have a thousand elements? Are you telling me I need to sort it nine? Or I need to run um, 999 iterations of it? No, you don't. Because what if it's already sorted to begin with? What if you have a thousand elements from one to a thousand and it's already sorted? That's a lot of kind of waste, CPU waste, if you're spending time kind of going through this algorithm and it's already sorted, right? So it, um, one thing you can do is you could say, hey, if during this single iteration, if I never swapped, if I never performed a swap at all, I know it's sorted. I hope that that makes sense. So for example, let's say I have the list one, two, three, four, five, and I go through it and at no time did I ever swap as I was comparing the current to the next, current to the next, current to the next, I never swap that means it must be sorted because I never had to swap anything. And so one way we can get that to, to check is we can create a variable that checks for the number of swaps. And we can set it up as zero. And if this triggers, right, if this triggers a swap, we'll just go ahead and increase the number of swaps counts to, um, we'll increase it by one for each swap that's performed. So if you swap, Make sure to increase that counts. And then once you're done with that single iteration, you would go ahead and um, return the number of swaps. So you would say, hey, how many swaps did, did, I, did I do? Did I do one swap, two swaps? If you did zero swaps, that's when we can stop. We don't have to keep doing this. So um, in this case, what I would do here is this single iteration would tell me how many swaps I performed. So this is also your number of swaps because it's being returned from this function. And what I could do is I could say, if the number of swaps is zero, well, in this case, I don't have to keep running the bubble sort. It's already sorted. I could just break like that. So if there were no swaps from the last iteration of bubble sort, from the latest, I shouldn't say last, but the latest iteration of bubble sort, 
of bubble sort. Then stop. It's already sorted. You don't have to keep going. And to prove that to you, let's go ahead and uh, print out some values. So within main, I want to print out these values right here. So what I would want to do is I would want to print out, uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and copy these just because I don't want to have to. Oh, that's fine. Let me go ahead and just write them myself. Um, so I want to print the number of single bubble, board, uh, bubble sort iterations. So I want to print out what iteration am I currently on. I want to print out that I stopped. And then I also want to print out, oh, that's pretty much it, actually. Yeah, that, print out that I stopped. And so let's go ahead and run it now. And in this case, I wonder how many iterations it'll take. So it stopped at seven. So it, it went through actually all, it went through eight um, iterations because it's on the seventh um, uh, index. So in this case, let's say if I had put them in sorted order. So let's say I put these as one through five, three, four, five, just like that. And let's run it. In this case, it's already sorted. Notice it stopped on the first case. It stopped on the first index. Um, stopped, it was already in sorted order. So it kind of short, um, it, it shortcutted the, the bubble sort. That's a little bit of an optimization that you could put in there. It's not as necessary to know. So if you feel a little bit uncomfortable with that last part that I did, it's not necessary to know at this time, but just know that it's there. Well, I hope that that made sense. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. I really hope that you enjoyed learning your first or mastering your first uh, sorting algorithm. We'll get started on insertion sort in a bit. Uh, thank you so, for, so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day.